Does it get easier over time? It doesn't get easier. You get more used to the pain. Chris, I am so excited for this. I heard so many great things from so many different people on your cap table. So thank you so much for putting up with my terrible British tones today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, huge fan of the podcast. Happy to be here. That is very, very kind of you. Now, listen, I spoke to Sunil of Amplify before we started, and he said to me that you and Runway is the perfect embodiment of founder product fit. So just take me to the founding moment of the company and that aha moment for you. Why does he say that? Yeah, uh, Sunil is too kind. Runway's uh, journey dates back to 2015, 2016, where I met my co-founders, Alejandro and Anastasis, in actually art school. Um, we went to, to a school um, that's a very unique school that combines art and technology. It's been running for 40 years here in New York, um, ITP from, from NYU. And um, the best way to think about it is art school for engineers and engineering school for artists. And while we were there, we were all coming from all sorts of different backgrounds and experiences from uh, programming, engineering, business. And we started just tinkering and playing around with state-of-the-art AI at that time. I know... I know a lot of things that happened now, but try to imagine where uh, models were and where research was uh, 10 years ago or eight years ago. Um, and we just built a lot of different things. We built, I remember um, Anastasis built this, this beautiful uh, video semantic search tool that you could just type a word and it will like create a trailer for you, um, combining all sorts of different uh, input videos, uh, analyzing uh, sequences and scenes. Um, and so we started tinkering with this idea of taking AI models or research at the time and building creative tools. We build these free transformers. Uh, we, we build using um, LSTMs, this co-pilot for writing. And so you could, uh, that runs entirely on the browser using WebGPU, using at the time TensorFlow.js, which is, which is a framework that was built at the time. Um, and you could write, and, and, a, and, a, and a model was co writing with you uh, different sentences, trained on different authors that you liked. And so we were just building experiments and experiments over experiments and realizing that there was something here, something special. And then we started delving into image and video generation. And again, PyTorch was like a year old, TensorFlow was like two years old. So things are very different from where we are today. <laughs> um, and I think we realized at some point that after building so many things, there was something special around both um, where things are, were heading and how much passion we had to for building these things and for building and, and, and understanding how to take these models and apply them in a creative artistic context. Um, and so I, I think the, the, we didn't found the company. I think the company founded us <laughs> and it was the only way we could uh, really continue building and, and doing what we're very passionate about, which is a, a new type of creative tools. I love that in terms of the company finding you. Uh, the interesting thing I kind of spoke to many of your investors about was also your background. You're not being in Silicon Valley. And you mentioned kind of artistry being at the center of both your education and also how you think today. They called you an outsider. <laughs> I'm sure in the loveliest way. Do you feel like an outsider? And how do you think being an outsider helps you be better? Yeah, um, I, I've, I've always felt a little bit like an outsider, to be honest, but very proud of it. Um, I've, I have a background in econ and business, but what I was studying that I was doing film on the side. So that was strange. And I felt like an outsider in both of those worlds. And then I was doing art, but also learning programming. So also felt a little bit of outsider in both of those. Um, and then I came to the U.S. and started our company while being in art school. That also felt like a bit of an outsider. I think it's um, it's been a common uh, thread of uh, my professional life, I would say, um, to really approach uh, domains that perhaps you might not have experience with a beginner's mindset and trying to learn and absorb as much as possible. I think being a... An outsider is both a blessing and a curse in the sense that um, it allows you to really reason from first principles. You discover everything and ask yourself why a lot. Um, at the same time, you take longer than other people because you, you're just experiencing for the first time. But the, the, I think the key aspect of being an outsider is that creativity really sparks from being able to merge different domains and different languages and different um, uh, professions um, in, in a coherent thing. And so Runway, I think it's the manifestation of that. It, it's a company that merges art and science in a, in a beautiful way 
by being able to be in between. Um, and so you, instead of being an outsider, you create your own world. That's much more powerful, I would say. You know, in terms of creating your own world, you do that when you kind of grow up in the world <laughs> as an adult. I always think that we're all running from something and that our past shape us in many ways. When you think about what you're running from, what would you say you're running from, Chris? Oh, um, that's, that's a good question. I've, uh, I grew up in Chile. I spent my whole uh, life mostly in Chile. Uh, and, and Chile is a, I don't know if you've been or not. No. Um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the south of Chile, Patagonia, but culturally and, 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 um, as a country, it's a very traditional structure, strict, um, tradition based country. So things are very rigid and it's very hard to do anything that goes beyond the norm. And, and really I felt that, um, I don't, I don't feel particularly passionate about, uh, people telling me what to do and how should I like follow or what are the norms. I think I'm, I'm running away a little bit from, from that tradition and trying to figure out more of, of the things I'm passionate about, the things I'm curious about. Um, and that was for me like uh, really going to art school. It was, it was a curiosity driven approach of just, I want to understand how much of um, AI I can take and put in the art world. And, and that's what I did. And I think that's, that's what I, I'm, I'm really passionate about. Would you say you're fearful of mediocrity? Uh, a little bit. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of, of, of people not pushing themselves, uh, both intellectually and, and creatively, um, and maintaining a status quo. I think that's, the, that's where companies go to die and where creatives go to, to, to not really progress is when you, when you feel you're too comfortable. Um, I, get, I get a little bit anxious when I feel like that. I totally agree. I think, yeah, David Goggins uh, says something brilliant, which is there's nothing more dangerous than a civilized person. Um, <laughs> but exactly. I, I do want to, on that, you know, it, it takes me to performance a little bit. As a leader today, how do you define high performance then? Yeah, um, I don't think there's one singular thing that I looked when I think about high performance, specifically in, in, a, in, in a fast moving field like we are right now. Uh, but I do think there are a few things that constantly uh, surface when you think about high performance. I think the first of all, the first one for me is being a, a, a vision and a motto and a, and a value that we've uh, embedded in the company since the very beginning. This idea of getting things done, just figure it out. Uh, it's become so much of a thing at Runway that I make a t-shirt that says just figure it out. If you learn how to learn, you can figure out anything. And that's like a superpower. Unlocking the ability to just do things without complaint, without understanding, or without necessarily um, uh, contextualizing things in the sense that you haven't done it before is really a superpower. And for us at, at Runway, it was. I've, I've never started a company. Um, I had to figure out how to stay in the, in, in the US to start the company. There were so many hurdles and challenges at the very beginning that we just had to figure out stuff. Chris, can, and, I, just dive, can I just dive in there and just ask? Yeah, go ahead. If you learn how to learn, there's nothing that you can't do. I love that. Can you help me understand, how do you approach learning? Do you have a process? Do you have a preference for the types of ways to learn? How do you approach it? Um, I'm very hands-on. If there's something I want to do, um, for example, when I was, uh, I was diving into uh, neural networks and, and really understanding the field, I was coming it from um, a place um, of, of a beginner's mindset. And so really what I did before try anything was I built uh, from the ground up a neural network. Um, every single uh, layer, every single um, uh, function, activation function in between, um, I curated the data set, I trained the model, and I built everything that I could get me a sense of how the inner parts of a system work, in this case, neural networks. And so um, I, for a long time, I didn't know what I was doing. You just try things, you try, you try, you hit walls, but you keep pushing yourself over and over and over and over. Um, I don't feel, uh, I, I like breath. So just go and read as many things as you can and then find a project that you like and then go as deep as you can on that. Um, I think being hands-on and being active on, on learning by doing something really helps make sense of the world. And that's something I've been trying to do in everything I'm trying to learn since then. How do you not get dejected when the learning is slow or not happening? It always happens that it's not going in as fast. You're finding it hard to find the resources. How do you not get dejected in those moments? Find brilliant people. 
find people that um, inspire you and can help you along the way. I think that that for me has been critical, and that that really is a, a core aspect of runway. You, I go into a room and I feel find myself uh, with the most brightest, more smartest, and kind people in the world, and they're all there to help you, and you can help them as well. And so, if you feel unstuck, if there's something that you can really come across it's too difficult. Just ask someone that is going to help you. And I think that's that's become you need the right people around and be surrounded by that's kind people who are going to be able to help. But um, it's not that common to just rely on someone else. What has been the most recent subject that you chose to really engage in a learning process, beginner's mindset on? Um, I mean, everything, to be honest, uh, from fundraising to building a company to hiring top talent, everything has been uh, a journey of learning. And I think really not being afraid to be embarrassed or mistaken, uh, because that's the only way you're going to do it. Um, more recently, I think we've, we've learned a lot with, with what we're doing with Gen 1 and Gen 2, which are our two latest video generation models. And there's so many assumptions that you, you might think about how these models actually work. But the moment you put them out, most of those assumptions are going to be changed. And so we're learning a lot. I mean, learning a lot about how people are using and how creatives are using some of the research we're putting out. What assumption has changed the most? Um, around video or about yeah, from, gen, from Gen 1 to Gen 2. Well, it's uh, like we, we assumed X and it was totally wrong. I think there's a lot. One that I've been thinking a lot about is um, UIs don't matter as much. Uh, I think a first approach to creative software comes from this idea that you have to be extremely thoughtful and extremely diligent on like how everything is going to look and it's how everything's going to work. But true is um, since the field is moving so fast, um, the assumptions that you have around how models are going to be used in a creative context might change rapidly. And so if you build a lot of assumptions and preconceptions on really how to get the best out of these models, um, you might be wrong really soon and you just need to throw it out and start again. And so keeping the value uh, at the center and less of what you think people might get out of those models is really, really critical. How do you do that? And what I mean by that is if you don't project out what they can get, it's kind of like a free for all. It's almost like product marketing to a horizontal audience. So if yeah. you don't guide the user, how do you give a great UX? You you test a lot. Um, like if you think about it, the first way the 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 best the, the first thing people do when they come across this idea of video generation is they they uh, assume that everything they know about film and cinema and film will replicate itself to this new medium. And the thing is, this is a new medium. It's a new tool. It's a new set of narrative possibilities. And so it's very different from everything we used in the past. The most challenging thing is uncovering those things. Because we haven't had the chance of doing it in the past. And so it's it's like you have your you find yourself in front of a camera, the first camera ever. And everything you've been using in the past are paintbrushes and paint tubes. A camera doesn't work in the same way as a paintbrush. And the things that you can do with it are only gonna be uncover and tap the moment the moment more people get their hands on it. That's how cinema get, was born. You have so many people trying this device and coming up with new forms that are beyond your comprehension or beyond what the creators even imagine. And I think that imparts a lot of what we do. We need to build this camera. We need to put this device into the hands of more people so we can collectively, as an artistic community, figure out all the primitives and UIs and narratives that will emerge from it. What do you think is harder, distribution or education post-landing? I think education is really has been really challenging these days. Uh, really helping people understand where things are, where things are heading. Uh, we we get a lot of comments around, for example, "Hey, Gen two is fantastic, but it can only generate four seconds, um, and it, I can use it because four seconds." And I'm like, "Yes, but remember, this is two months old, and it's going to change." And today we're recording this. We you just change it. You can now generate eighteen seconds. And so all the assumptions that you had around how you couldn't use it because it was just changed, just completely like now it's a new open set of possibilities. Um, and so educating, can I, I would can say- I, Can I ask you, I, I think straight away to Dylan Field at Figma with this. And what I mean by that is like, they have really heavy build outs technologically. And you chose to kind of build in public where bluntly, you know, four seconds is short, but it's better to be out in the wild and have people use it. Dylan, 
almost took the other side, which is really didn't release for two to three years until it was much more perfect. Why did you decide to release knowing that maybe it was challenging for people to use in full? Because uh, I think every company is different and every product iteration uh, needs to be tuned to the audience that you're targeting. In, in our case, this is something new. This is the idea that you can generate video, create video with nothing more than words, for example, has never been tested out before. And so you can, for years, build assumptions on how people are going to use it and the value and opportunities on the market. But the truth is that you might be wrong and really wrong. And if you build with that assumption for too long, you're going to miss really getting feedback and really understanding and learning from use cases and from people who are going to be using it. In other cases where domains and perhaps the value is a bit more defined, you can spend a bit more time and building in, in private and then release. I think for us, it was pretty much the realization that the only way to move forward the field and the intersection of creativity and, and, and artificial intelligence was, was we build by really closely, as close as we can with the community that we're building towards, which is artists and filmmakers. And we're gonna gain a lot more from being there than being too silent or too private about what we're doing. Do you think it's your job to master time to value. And what I mean by that is, do you need to show people greatness within the first few seconds or is it a longer journey? Oh, absolutely. I think being able to use a model uh, like Gen2 in just a few seconds, is critical. We've, we've released uh, only a couple of days ago, this idea you can preview frames. And so when you generate video, sometimes you're in the dark because you don't know exactly what might come out of it. It would be great if you can preview what's going on while the model is generating. And so we offer now customers a way of previewing specific frames and then generate. And that made a huge difference because the time to see the result was so much faster than ever before that usage went up to the roof because people understood that how the model was working and it was, uh, it was showing you a bit more of, of the inner workings of the model itself. Um, and so it's really important to now, I think a couple of years ago, it was more challenging because both infrastructure and inference and speed wouldn't allow you to do it at the speed of what we need. I think now we're, we're able to do that. Can I ask, I, I'm a paying user of Runway. You have options and there's kind of a paywall page and free is an option and you can click free and go through. Many don't give you free as an option and it's quite a hard decision on the consumer side of pay or don't enter. What, why did you decide to let free be an option versus what others did of just pay or don't use? Yeah, I think it's, it goes back to the, the, the idea of um, helping people understand where things are and understanding that this is a creative tool. And a key concept in creativity is experimentation. Like if you ask any artist in the world uh, how they think about their practice, they speak a lot about experimenting. They're experimenting with techniques, with ideas, with processes, with art, with combining uh, references. So when you're working with a creative tool, you need to experiment. You need to be able to try things multiple times. And sometimes um, um, it might take longer than you might expect. And so the free preview for us and just allowing people, we, we for example, have a limited plan. So you can generate as many videos as you want. You just go ahead and like explore anything you want. Just don't worry about being charged because you can generate as many as you want with no charge. Um, that is really a creative liberation. It's a way of experimenting. And I think that's a core value of, of the product itself. You need to be, this is not, these are not facts. Uh, these are not, there's no only one solution. It's an infinite set of universes that you can create. So go ahead and experiment. And I think that's a key aspect of why we, we chose to do that. You mentioned experimentation being key to the workflows of artists and creators. So many are scared that AI will replace them. You know, we're seeing the strikes. Uh, you always say that it's an enabler. Has the media got AI wrong in terms of replacement, not enabler? And is enabler not just an intermediary step to replacement? <laughs> you know, I think a lot about this. Um, I think on the one end, language models have dominated the discourse, the public discourse. And the whole field of AI has been reduced to this idea that AI is just language models. And I think part of it has been due to the success, of course, of ChatGPT, which has been in the minds of everyone. Yet it's really important to be nuanced. Like in everything in the world, it's about in-betweens or gradients and it's spectrum. And AI is not just chatbots. I think the reductive view of thinking about 
what AI is bringing to the table and how revolutionary and, and how much change is going to do is just not an interface where you can chat with a system. It's more than that. Uh, and, and specifically in film and video, um, we have millions of users and we have so many people using the tool to make films, to make short films, to make award-winning films. And it's such a liberating tool for them when they realize they can iterate on their ideas faster because you go back to experimentation. And so a lot of the discourse I feel sometimes comes from the place of, of um, uh, I guess, extrapolating the current state of language models and the challenges they have, which, which, which are true, to other domains, which divert and are very different from, from, from just building chatbots. Um, and so in the, in the one end, I think the core realization for me and really uh, what I've been trying to emphasize more is that we need better stories. We need better narratives. We only hear one story these days, which is horror stories. Um, and I think part of it has been heavily influenced by fiction, by movies we watch, by books we read. Um, but that's one story. That's one way of seeing the world. There's other stories and other narratives that can help us really untap another set of possibilities. And so with Runway, we're untapping those possibilities of, hey, not everything is a language model. It's more and more complex than that. Let's take a look and go deeper into that. I agree. Who's going to tell that story, though? The story has to come from someone who's not incentivized. So it can't be you and it can't be investors. And so who is it then? I think I agree. It has. It can be one person. Stories, the best stories and the best way of shaping a technology is by having people use a technology and have them shape the stories. Uh, can I be... Bl I'm so sorry. I'm yeah? in the UK as well. Go why, ahead. why do screenwriters like strike... If it's an enabler, what do they not see? Um, I think it, a lot of the discourse around our replacements comes from um, this rather unsophistic uh, view of the world that you're going to type in um, something, just write me a script or write me a movie, click enter, and you get entirely the exact same script that you did a month, a year ago. And... For me, that's come from a place of maybe maybe you've never used these tools. Maybe you've never tried to actually experiment with it. Um, I see a lot of uh, articles these days which are like, I've I, I've written this first paragraph with ChatGPT, and therefore I predict the whole set of like consequences X, Y, or C. And it's like, I mean, sure, you wrote a paragraph, but like writing a book and writing a script is way more than just pressing enter. It's a process. I go back to experimentation. It's about feedback, and it's about people, and it's about using these tools in the context of more a macro project. And so um, I think I would invite more of those, more people who are very skeptical over these tools about to, to use them and to experiment with them and see where they are and see how they provide value to your creative process and understand that this is not a zero-sum game, which I think a lot of people think about it in that way, which is you're going to type in, get me a movie, click enter, and you're going to get a movie out of it, a perfect movie, exactly the way people have been making movies for the last 100 years. And of course, it doesn't work like that. It's more, it's much more nuanced, it's much more complicated and involves a lot of uh, feedback processes within. I totally get you in terms of the importance of those, the level of feedback processes. Can I ask, I'm always stuck here, Chris. What's more important, data size or model size? And how do you think about, like, bluntly, the importance of size of model? I think size of model matters in the sense that um, we've seen that larger models uh, parameter wise are going to get better at doing more things uh, in multimodalities. But at the same time, it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and there's opportunities to get smaller, get models to be smaller, but has more specific to the type of thing that you're trying to accomplish. And we're already seeing approaches like this in the language domain. And we're start seeing, we'll start to see this as well in the image and video domain. So one you, model do you, that do you think we'll see the verticalization of models or like Richard Socher with you.com very much pronounces the importance of a single model to rule them all, which is much more horizontal. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be a single model to rule them all. That's like saying that the internet would only have one e-commerce site. Um, there's many, there depends. You have something like Shopify where everyone can build their own website and their own e-commerce site and you can sell anything. Um, if you think this is the tool and it's a general purpose tool, and I say tool at AI in general, there's so many opportunities to build different types of models and different ways of working with those models. And it's still very early to be so specific to say, oh, we're going to only use that thing or that other thing. I think we need to be more, more humble in recognizing that 
it's still new and it's still changing. And so I will be open to have a, a, different, a different perspective on that. How do you think about model lifespan? Well, like for you guys at Runway, do you have to continuously update models? Is it on a yearly cadence, uh, like multi-year? How do you think about that? <laughs> Uh, these days is on a weekly cadence. Um, <laughs> I think I, I've, I found myself hearing a lot about models uh, as, an, as, as the mode, and mode has been something that Silicon Valley has been discussing for, for some months now. I think models are not a mode. Uh, models eventually don't matter. What matters most is the people building those models and how fast can you change and learn from those models. And so I don't think that's why I go back. There's no one singular model that's going to rule them all. Um, what, it's impacts, much, what impacts how fast you can learn and change? Uh, what we were discussing before, getting to hands of people and understanding how it works. What are their values uh, they're getting out of it? And pushing the boundaries of, of both training, research, um, and figuring out improvements. We... Uh, Four or five years ago, state of the art and language was was totally different from where we're right now. Same with images. The basic assumptions of how image generation worked uh, just a couple of years ago was completely different from where we are today. So if you find yourself trying to optimize, and engineers love to uh, optimize things, uh, that was the wrong thing to optimize for. And so be very humble, be very clear that whatever you have right now today might change. And just ship it as fast as you can, learn as much as you can, and continue to learn from there. Can I ask you, you know, when we think about creativity, um, someone once described hallucinations to me as students who kind of are brilliant but go off their meds, which is a form of creativity in some <laughs> respects. How do you think about hallucinations as a feature or a bug, especially given the artistry and creativity that's inherent in what Runway is? Yeah, um, and this is this is where this is a great example of being a bit more nuanced because hallucinations in language models are different from perhaps what we might understand as hallucination in video models. Huh. Um, if you're asking for a fact, if you're asking a model, uh, a language model, to give you the capital of Chile, and the model gets it wrong and starts rumbling and hallucinating other things, you're gonna be like, "Hey, that that's not true. That I wanted a fact, and you gave me a creative interpretation of of the answer." Um, but in a video domain, in an image domain, in a creative context, maybe you want to be the model to, to have the model rumble a little bit or go off the charts. So maybe you can control the temperature to see where you want to go. Because again, it's a creative process. And so it depends. I think in some cases, uh, it's actually a feature and it will actually help you uncover more. And in some other cases, you, there's no, you can't afford to have a hallucination if you're, you're, at, you're getting and you need facts. I, I totally get you. Can I ask on the artistry and the artisan element? I had Jan McCoon on the show and he spoke about how unwaveringly this will be an open ecosystem and the benefits that will come from that. With, with artisan uh, developers, creators, do you agree with him on the open beating close model? And how do you think about that? I think open is always better in the sense that allows you to get to a broader audience faster um, and you also get different perspectives because people can build on top uh, of, of models and we've seen this with with some of uh, the the models we've released uh, that have created some sort of like creative explosion of sorts where people are building things that we never thought of building and that's great um, i think again it's more nuanced once you start defining where you want to build products for people. And so open source versus closed source is only one part of that stack. You're not going to build an entire company just by being open source or closed source. There's way more than that. Um, and so it really depends. Some companies, I think, are going to go into open source more and more because it helps their value uh, prop. Some others are going to go closed source if you want to build other types of products. I think we're always striving to be in between. We've already open source some of the most, uh, I would, uh, a lot of relevant models in the space that have been game changers. And at the same time, we have more proprietary models as, as well than we might never open source. Chris, what is the biggest rate limiting factor to the runway product today? If I had a magic wand for your product team, for your tech team, and could take away a problem, what would it be? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think speed. I mean, and I say this because we're moving very fast, incredibly fast. But speed really matters. And so the rate limit, I would say sometimes for us, is um, uh, being able to move even faster. And those, those things come in place with um, sometimes compute. There's a limitation of compute that um, we, the industry has at the moment. 
And so sometimes you're constrained because of compute. Uh, sometimes it's constrained about um, use cases or deploying those models and making them efficient. I think it depends, but speed as a constant thing that you're thinking about when deploying models and training models is for us really critical. Why is it difficult to retain speed over time? Um, I think was, I mean, on their organizational side of things, as companies continue to grow, you have more nodes of communication, more uh, uh, coordination elements. And so we're, we're a small team, we're 55 people. So we move super fast and that's, that really matters. That's a competitive advantage. If you're a 10,000 person organization trying to move at the speed that we're moving, it's going to be complicated. Um, but eventually you start moving more. And that's why we've been so conscious on really having a small lean team, a very high performance team, rather than just hiring people uh, for the sake of hiring people. So um, many so many on your cap table told me about the performance element of your small team. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, what have been your biggest lessons on hiring a performance first, speed first, but small team? Focus on focus on again what we were discussing before, people that can figure things out and get things done. I think a lot of the mistakes I've done in the past on hiring is like we we focus too much on credentials or past experiences or people who came from all these lofty universities or companies and not on the folks who are hungry and who just wanted to do things. How, um, do, you how do you test for that in the interviews? Uh, we've iterated a lot. We've learned a lot. <laughs> we've learned a lot. We have an interview process now that I think is it's, uh, one, of, one of the best, of course, on biases, but it, it, by, it, it measures your proactivity and your level of, of course, there's a baseline level for every position and domain, but at the same time, it measures your ability to get things done. Um, and there is a bunch of experiments and uh, exercises we run and interviews, and then we'll get together the whole uh, folks, the team that was interviewing, and try to make sure that the values of what makes run really special are there in that person. When you look at your interview process today, what would you like to know as a founder listening that you could share with them? Like what works, what doesn't, what can someone learn from your interview process? Um, doing is more than talking. Um, I think there are, there are a lot of great people who are great at interviewing and are great at saying what you want to hear. And I'm always more, I've been cautious about that now and, and really understanding, okay, I, I get it, but can you do this? Can you show me how to do it? Can you do it right now? Uh, and so focus on, focus on, on actions more than, than words. What would you say are your biggest mistakes in hiring other than credentials? Credentials and people that are not, uh, I think, humble. I think humbleness is a key component of, of a company. The rate of learning as a company, building a company is about just pushing every single day. You're going to quit. You're, you really want to quit every single day. You need to push it again and again and again. And, and it's, it's kind of like a mad process. You need to be extremely, have a lot of tenacity to be able to do it every time. But at the same time, recognize that some things you're going to do are going to be wrong. And it's fine. You might spend months working on something and the next day you're going to throw it to the trash. And it's fine. Don't worry about it. Have a very stoic approach to it and continue moving on. So people who have very definitive worlds, views of their world, perhaps <laughs> what I was running away from before you asked me, um, don't really match and work in runway. Uh, people that feel like that's the way, that's the only way, are not going to be able to learn as much on a field that's ever-changing. And so humbleness for us has been a core value. Look for people who are asking questions, who are knowing and are um, um, have always uh, thought of embracing change, uh, which I feel is the only constant these days. I, I find people who are boring and capable. That's my two <laughs> things. I love. And you know why? Because people are never as boring as they come across in an interview process. They're always more fun. You're obviously your most boring self, but boring people are rarely arrogant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also I feel like we always tend to, there's always like the norm, the medium, you can hire folks that are just like good, but not great and excellent. And they're going to raise the bar for everyone. And I think that's, that's really what you need to look for. Dude, what do you think your other some like complete startup BSs? You're outside of the ecosystem. What do you think is some other like crap advice that you see given about building companies now? Um, I'm very cautious about recipes and 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 rules and 
and algorithms in, in the sense of company building. I think there's no rules. There's no algorithm. You just have to do it. You just have to do it. I think it's, if you've never been to a city, you can read everything about that city and you can read everything everyone else wrote about that city. If you've never been to Paris, you can read everything about Paris. Every writer that has ever been to Paris, you can uh, learn how to cook French food. You can do everything you know and, and, and find and, and understand about Paris, but nothing, nothing will beat like being in Paris for 10 minutes. You're gonna learn so much by being there than by reading anything else. And so for me, this is similar. If you wanna know about something, uh, don't read recipes, don't uh, read blog posts, don't absorb, don't like try to build on the, on the ideas of someone else. Just do it yourself. Um, and you will figure, you will build a much more coherent process and idea of how things work. And so I'm very skeptical about people who are like, or are, are writing or suggesting or advising of like, here's how you do things. It's like, no, 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 that's good. That's a good sign. But just, if you want to figure out stuff, just do it yourself. What recipe did you follow that did not work out? <laughs> so many. Um, we don't, um, we structure teams uh, and runway in this thing called ensembles that we came up with. It's a way that we, it works for, for, for our team. It doesn't come from any of other more traditional scrums or, or, or ways of organizing teams. Um, at some point we thought, oh, we need like OKRs and systems because some, an investor told me once that that's the way companies do it. We try and it's like, this is, no. <laughs> Why this is the worst thing you can do right now. It's like, you don't need this. Um, but I could see the appeal of it because it gives you a way of making sense of the world. And it's, 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 it's easy and it's, you don't have to think too much. You just follow a process, but you're not really getting a lot of it. You're perhaps it worked for someone else, but not for you right now. And so there's so many, but team organizations and finding objectives and ways of defining those objectives. I will be skeptical about those very, very uh, thoughtful like uh, frameworks. I, I totally agree with you there. Um, I, I do want to ask, you mentioned learning the fundraising process earlier. It's a weird ass world, I have to admit, especially if you're not kind of trained in Silicon Valley casting school. Um, what have been some of your biggest lessons in fundraising for Runway? That was from Zavain. Oh, um, I can, there's so much there. Um, you asked me about being an outsider and I, and I felt that my first um, years of fundraising were totally I felt totally like an outsider. I, I, I didn't knew anyone in Silicon Valley. I didn't knew any investor in Silicon Valley. I wasn't connected to anyone either. So it was a very like hard start, cold start. I had to figure my, I had to figure it out. And so that's where I go back as to that mentality of just, okay, you want to do something, just do it. One of my biggest learnings on fundraising has been, I would say, uh, focus on the right investors and ask yourself, ask questions to the investors the same way they ask questions to you. Uh, you should be much more inquisitive in the type of things they want to build and they want to see in the company. So what, what questions do you ask for founders listening? Because I totally agree with you. No founders ever ask questions, bluntly. Not none, not, but like 99% don't. What questions should they ask? I think what do you, for us, something I've been always trying to strive and find in my investors is really making sure that we're both on the same, on the same direction. Because an investor might come to understand your company from a completely different vantage point from the one you have, and that's not going to work. Long term, it's not going to work. You're going to be with this people, with this team, with that investor for years. So you really need to be aligned. So have them pitch to you, the company, and see if you're figuring out and saying the same things. Um, and that's what I've realized sometimes that like I had remember an investor that um, gave us a term sheet um, and... We had them describe what Runway was, and we're like, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> Just, I love your term sheet, beautiful valuation, everything else, but, but I don't wanna, that's not gonna work. Uh, I don't think we're aligned. And so I realized that just by having that conversation and asking them questions. Many would say, I don't mind, it's the best deal. My question to you is, do you think investors really add value in my, no offense, isn't it all just you anyway? <laughs> I'm being honest. I, um, I think it's, um, I think no one is going to care about your company, about what you do more than you. And so if you try to think that an investor is going to change everything you do, or it's going to bring something that you never thought of doing, I think you're wrong. I think and the investor, the role in the investor is not to build a company. It's to trust that you will build a company and that you will build uh, a generational product. And so I think they help sometimes. They, they might help you with intros and with other things. But 
it's not going to make a big difference in the sense that the success of what you're building comes from grinding and the tenacity of waking up every day and doing it for multiple days in a row, even when things are very hard. And so don't rely on like some magical solution or helpfulness of just one person, because that's not going to, that's not how things actually work. What was the hardest round to raise, Chris? You've had multiple rounds now in quite quick succession. And the company's actually you know, close to five years old, which is kind of an interesting data point. What was the hardest round to raise? I think the hardest round for us was our Series A. That was, uh, so the company was started on late 20, 2018, 2019. Um, and then we raised a seed. Uh, and then we've collected, since then, every 12 months or so, we've raised a different round. We're now, we, we've, we just raised a, a, a Series C. Um, our Series A was, was definitely, I would say, the most challenging in the sense that we were pitching, again, this is 2019. 2020, we were pitching building uh, a generative AI company. We, were, we wanted to build, and we still are obsessed with this idea that generative models are going to change how you think about media, entertainment, how you think about content, how you think about creativity. And so we, we went to investors and we showed them the state of the art research that we had at the time for image generation and told them, hey, that thing that you see here is going to be the future of media. And if you search for an image um, that you could generate using a model in 2020, you'll be like, Chris, come on. That's like, of course not. We're so far away. I mean, I have so many investor emails of people telling me, love your team, et cetera, but journey AI is not a thing. Stop saying it's a thing. It's not a thing. Um, and so realizing that after so many rejections, because <laughs> hundreds of rejections, you're like still mad or like still, still, sorry, still um, obsessed with making it work. Until it works, um, and we're not all about. Did you ever, just did you ever doubt it? Did you ever doubt it? You know, Mark Andreessen says there's no such thing as a bad idea, only a bad time. You know, when when a hundred people tell you no, it's not the right time. No, it's too early. Do you doubt it? I think, of course, you doubt it. At some point, you're like, well, am, am I seeing something perhaps not clear enough, or am I mistaken? At the same time, I think a lot of really good investors are the ones that are not looking for patterns. They're not looking for the norm, the average, the middle of the curve. You need to be able to, to be able to understand that there's risk and things are going to not play out in the way that you thought every company will, will work. And so when it comes to doubting, doubting is actually good. Like you need to be able to be aware. It's everyone. So everyone is thinking one way and I'm thinking in another way. That's really interesting because that's different. That's not patterns. Everyone's finding the same patterns. I'm thinking about something else. If it works, it's going to be huge. If it doesn't, I'll learn something. Um, so I think actually doubting is sometimes, sometimes good. No, I, I do agree with you in terms of also the humility to doubt. When you look back over the rounds, you mentioned kind of raising every year from the seed in 28 or late 2018. What would you have done differently looking back on the rounds, knowing all that you do now? Something I've, I've learned a little more over time um, has been always emphasizing the vision of the company. Um, I think products and models don't really matter in the sense that what really matters in a company is the people that you have and the collective tissue of what brings them together. And sometimes for me, that was an obvious thing. It was like, hey, we're artists and researchers and engineers building a completely new set of tools. But I sometimes like, didn't have to mention that because I thought everyone knew that. But of course they didn't. <laughs> and reminding myself of like, hey, the product that you have today is going to change. It's going to change because these people are changing it all the time. So here's the vision and here's what we're building it. Four years ago, we were like, hey, media and entertainment, every company will be using these models to create everything from movies to short films. It's going to happen. And I didn't spend enough time emphasizing that because I thought it was obvious. I didn't realize, of course, of course, it's not, not that obvious. So Always emphasizing and reminding yourself of like the vision for me has been a good a good learning. Can I ask you a, a tough one? And I'm sorry for it, but I am interested. You know, your last round in Series C, it was a high price. Um, when you think about like scaling into valuations, many startups they have to scale into their valuation. From a business and a money standpoint, it's a scale into. Do you think you need to scale into your valuation? 
I don't think it's underpriced. I think it's very early, I would say, for runway and for the industry advice. And, and I don't tend to overemphasize or focus on valuations, to be honest. Um, I think valuations are, if you're optimizing for evaluation, you're optimizing for the wrong thing. Evaluation is just the market giving, the market giving you a price based on multiple considerations and, and, and elements and variables. But if you, if you think of optimizing to grow into the valuation, you're going to miss so many things because the incentives are put in the wrong place. And you might do things that are going to be great for the valuation, but not great for the company long term. And so uh, it's always striving between, I would say, short term and long term vision of, OK, valuation is a great sign in terms of where the market values what we're doing. But really, where we're at right now, it's not even like close to our final shape and form in 10 years. Let's work towards that because the company is going to worth. If we do succeed at doing that, the company is going to worth a hundred times more than what it is right now. If we try to just grow into that small valuation, I, I totally get you, and I agree with that. When you think about your views on being a venture-backed startup, uh, I think this was Sunil who asked this. How have your views on what it is to be a venture-backed startup? How have they changed since the founding of the company? I think for us, it was. It was slightly different and in the sense that there wasn't really another option, to be honest. Um, we all, the three founders are immigrants. Uh, we didn't have friends or families. We didn't have savings. There was nowhere to start building a company. And so sometimes I feel it's a privilege in being able to do internal rounds or not raise to be able to build and hire an excellent team. I think for us, it was way radical and way different in the sense that we had four months to figure out how we're going to like stay in the country, build a company, hire a team, build a product, do everything we need to do. And really the best way of doing that is by working alongside some of the best investors and raising, raising capital and being a best uh, venture back startup was really the only way of really achieving our goals and realizing our, our vision. Chris, I'm going to get my magic wand out again. You can add anyone to your cap table, anyone in the world. It could be a you know, Christopher Nolan. It could be Julia Roberts. It could be, I don't know, you name it. Who would you add? Anyone? Um, you know, I'm going to do a boring answer, <laughs> which is I don't think there's anyone that's going to change your company. And so in the sense that the only people who are going to change it are, are you and your team. And so I could add people for the sake of being close to them or having fun with them or having... Let's play a game. If you have Bob Iger or the CEO of Disney and they said, hey, we're going to commit to creating all of our assets through Runway, that would fundamentally change the nature of cartoons. That, that's and a great business enterprise deal. Uh, but <laughs> but we need more Disney's. We need many more of those. I, I, my point being, um, I, don't, I don't have favorites uh, in the sense that I don't think there's one single person or uh, people that are going to be so radically different to everything you do. Uh, just trust your instincts and, and build a great team. What belief do you hold that you are scared to admit you hold? That's a, that's a good one, a profound one. Um, I think a belief that I hold that I'm perhaps scared to, to admit that I'm hold is that I don't think we yet realize how transformative AI is going to be. Like whatever thought we might have, it's completely wrong. And people are thinking about it in ways that might not even make sense in a couple of years. And it's very hard because it's very hard to understand that magnitude of change. Um, and I think people are obsessing or engineering things right now. Um, and I think it might not matter in a few more, few more years. Chris, do you have children? I don't. I only have a dog. Okay. Um, do you worry that when you're changing an industry as you are, what it takes to do that is unwavering commitment, unwavering. To be a good father, a good parent, you have to actually give a little. Do you worry that you're going to be able to sustain the performant element of Chris with being a father? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I think you can if you care a lot about what you do. Um, I don't think there's, I mean, for me personally, I don't see a separation between work and life. Uh, they're, they're one. Um, if you're passionate about what you're doing, uh, if you, you need to live, give a little when you're raising a family, uh, of course, you can find the time. Just be thoughtful and care a lot about the people around you, which is actually a value of runway. Like we have four values and one of them is care. Just care a lot. Um, and when you care a lot, you're going to be able to, to do stuff like that. 
Yeah. That and night nannies. I think paying for <laughs> services helps a lot in terms of children. So yes, I agree with you totally. Uh, listen, Chris, I want to do a quick fire round. So I'm going to say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. So what do others not know that you know to be true? My co-founder Anastasi has this beautiful quote, uh, the best movies are yet to be made and the best stories are yet to be told. I think that's, that's the, the where we're heading. Do all AI founders need to be in the valley? No, I'm in New York and I've been into the, in the Ceph like just a couple of times. I mean, I was slightly teeing myself up with that one. <laughs> uh, what, what do people not understand about Runway that you wish they did? It's very early. We're a five-year-old company, but I think we're, we're just a baby. What single element would you most like to change about the AI community? Stories. We need better stories. We need more nuanced stories. This is not about horror stories or fairy tales. It's about humans. And so let's focus back on people. What is the strongest belief you had, which turned out to be wrong? Fancy UIs don't matter. It doesn't matter if you think about building beautiful UIs, what matters is using these models to just do great things. Everything else will follow that. What's the most painful lesson you've learned that you're pleased to have learned? Uh, building anything is painful. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's hard and you want to quit. Just don't. Does it get easier over time? You get, it doesn't get easier. You get more used to the pain. How so? You start building a skin. You understand, you trust, you, you build an intuition and things as you grow and scale are going to be different. You're going to have different challenges to scale. The challenges are going to be different. Uh, but if you keep a stoic mindset and just understand that there are things you can control and things you can't control, you can do great stuff. You can have dinner with anyone, dead or alive. Who do you have dinner with and why? Uh, my, my mom. I haven't seen her in a while. I love that answer. Uh, most people go for like LeBron James, so that's a lot more fulfilling. Uh, tell me, what role does AI play in society in 10 years? You said we can't comprehend it. We don't even know. How do you project forward plan AI's role in society? We're going to stop referring to it as AI. We're just going to think about it as tools. I think I'm really looking forward to the moment in time where there's no discussion around AI in the same way that today we don't discuss the internet as a, as a thing. It's just so ingrained in everything we do. When you go to the bank and you do a wire transfer, you're not saying, I'm going to log into the internet to do a wire transfer. You just do it. You know that's the way you do it. And I think we're heading to a world where everything we do is going to be built and powered by models. You just don't, you, you forget about it and you just continue your life. Final one. 10 years time, 2033. Where's Runway then? Making movies, the best movies. Chris, as I said, I did 17 reference calls on this. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to do this with you. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me here. It was a great conversation. You are a star, my friend.